So, um, welcome. Thank you for coming and listening. Um, I am Nikolai Markov. I work here in Chicago Northwestern University in the Division of Pulmonary Physical Care. I started my academic career in general just a year and a couple of months ago, and I do bioinformatics analysis. So I analyze biological data that we hear uh, generate and study uh, in relation to different pulmonary diseases. Um, so I want to start with this disclaimer that my background is computer science background, and this presentation will be mostly literature review about SARS-CoV-2 and COVID-19. And however, we have uh, recently published a preprint uh, describing certain aspects of COVID-19 uh, in which we see in our ICU at Northwestern Memorial Hospital in downtown Chicago. And I will talk about this too in the end of the slide. And I, I, I'm prepared for some questions. Uh, however, I want to make, uh, to let you know that I will write down every question that I haven't answered and track it down later and get back to you. That's my intention, at least. Um, so I will talk about the virus itself. Um, then I will talk about pathophysiology of the disease um, and the immune response. And in the end, I will present one hypothesis that we came up with that explains why um, we see such severe cases in associated with COVID-19 sometimes. So to start with, let's look uh, the enemy in the eye. So this is what SARS-CoV-2, the virus looks like. Uh, these are individual particles. Uh, this is just high resolution of the image on the left. Uh, you can see. Uh, particles here. This is, um, those tubes are cilia, ciliated cells. They are part of the uh, respiratory tract epithelium, and this is upper epithelium um, somewhere close to the uh, throat and, and mouth. Um, and these are the viral particles that replicate, that sit here, replicate, they can infect, they can uh, start the process. And this is the same image at the bottom. And these are images taken uh, from cross sections of similar tissue in different patients, but, and here, stained with pink or purple are uh, viral RNA. So you can see where there's pink, there's virus, and this is a cross section of the same tissue. So, and this is again, the same thing in another slice. And you can see small black dots here are those particles and those, uh, round things are the cilia or the ciliated cells. So, so what is this virus which, which we call SARS-CoV-2? It is a virus, it is part of the coronaviruses, uh, which is a big family, has multiple viruses, four genus uh, in it, um, and they are all pretty large uh, viruses that are encoded. They, they have their genetic material in single-stranded positive sense RNA, um, which is surrounded by 
some proteins and together they form a particle that is about 60 to 140 nanometers uh, in diameter. It, it floats, it sits on top of things, it survives some of the uh, things on different surfaces for different amount of time. It, the main source of transmission is thought to be uh, aerosols. So when we speak, we generate tiny droplets of liquid and within them, uh, the particles. So that's, I don't know, the physical characteristics. Um, these viruses, all in general coronaviruses, cause either respiratory or gastrointestinal or neurological diseases or some of the combinations of those. Um, there are seven human um, coronaviruses, four of them are here and they are, they just cause common cold, uh, some light respiratory infection that doesn't do any substantial damage. However, three of them are highly pathogenic and this is SARS-CoV-1, MERS and now SARS-CoV-2. But also there, there are quite a few coronaviruses uh, which infect animals like pigs, cattle, chickens, and uh, we study, th this is, so previous, those two previous SARS-CoV and MERS and the viruses that infect uh, animals are our way to compare SARS-CoV-2 virus and understand what's going on and generate ideas about uh, how, how the disease actually uh, progresses and what it does. So a little bit about those two previous uh, serious coronaviruses and epidemics. So there was an outbreak in 2003 with just 8,000 cases, pretty high mortality rate of 9% uh, in general and more than 50 in, in an older population. And it, it got global emergency and lots of studies, uh, some started to pay attention to SARS-CoV and et cetera, but then after several years, it all went uh, slowly down. And there are, I think there started uh, several initiatives to develop a vaccine, but no vaccine is available. Uh, similar thing happened with MERS, uh, which is Middle Eastern Respiratory uh, Syndrome virus. And outbreak happened in 2012. It had high mortality, fewer cases. Again, it was contained and so gradually, uh, you know, we forgot about this maybe. And now I just checked the CDC for the US, 3% uh, mortality rate. So, that particle that you saw on the uh, scanning microscope uh, image is contains, it consists of uh, several proteins that uh, create the particle. Inside it, there's uh, the genomic material that is needed to replicate the virus and um, it finds entry into the organism and starts causing damage by viral entry by targeting specific protein. So this virus evolved uh, in such a way that its spike protein, those uh, things on the surface that stick out, uh, is targeting AC2 receptor uh, which stands for 
angiotensin converting enzyme 2 uh, in our cells. So if a cell has AC2 uh, receptor, it sticks out on the surface of the cell, then the virus, if the virus comes near, it will bind to this. And with the help of another protein that again is found on our cells, it, this protein will help the virus get inside the cell and start um, infection. So, we have, we have recently, like in the last five years, it became feasible to uh, identify where, where which proteins are made in the human organism by, by taking samples, of course, and measuring what, what genes are currently active in which cells. So um, this initiative has been that's called human cell atlas tries to map every cell in human organism and answer the question of what what this cell is making what type is this cell and so we don't have a complete map yet but we were able to ask the, this question where are those viral entry proteins that are necessary for the SARS-CoV-2 virus to start an infection where are they actually produced and um, a survey of about 30 different tissues and probably if I remember correctly a couple of million maybe two million cells in general the data set uh, gave those answers that it is nasal epithelial cells um, and generally respiratory tract epithelial cells, so in the top. Then alveolar type 2 epithelial cells, which are in the lungs in the alveoli, um, in the terminal small chambers where gas exchange happens. And also several other tissues also have those uh, proteins expressed, uh, including gastrointestinal tract. So this, this was the virus. The virus, SARS-CoV-2, gives us COVID-19, the disease. What does the disease look like? Um, according to those reviews, uh, this is what it looks like. Many, many patients, around 80%, just recover without treatment. They, clear the virus, uh, maybe they develop very mild symptoms. Um, the symptoms are uh, usually manifested around day five, for some two, for some seven in this range, and like for the majority of the people by 12 days, the symptoms will be there, if they will be there, if you have symptoms at all. However, um, people can, people who are infected can start infecting other people. And so this virus injects in the cells and starts producing copies of itself, which get to other people and come out of the mouth and nose. After two, three days, oh, not after, before, pre, two, three days before the symptoms manifest. So this is, this is one of the differences between SARS-CoV-1, which was in 2003, and SARS-CoV-2, which is now, and this probably uh, is one of the reason, one of the more important reasons why we have the pandemic on such big scale, because people don't know they, they're infecting someone. And then, so other patients who do not recover without treatment, they eventually get hospitalized. And there, among them, many have comorbidities. Uh, some part needs ICU treatment. Uh, this is a huge 
estimate range I know. However, you know, different reports from different parts of the world, from different hospitals, say different things. So um, this part requires mechanical ventilation and usually people develop pneumonia. Some of the people develop are acute respiratory distress syndrome, which is RDS. And there are several other complications that can happen. And this is very skewed in the age distribution towards all the population, which is important. Uh, however, it is also seen in other diseases and, and generally the immune and inflammation are uh, more severe for older population. So what, what happens with the virus and how, how those symptoms and complications happen? So again, the virus finds a cell or happens to be near a cell which express AC which has a protein AC2 on its surface with team PRSS and the virus gets in the cell and starts uh, multiplying, replicating itself and also destroying the cell. Um, and it happens somewhere in the upper respiratory tract. At some point, via unknown mechanism, the virus jumps into the lung, into the distal lung where gas exchange happens. Uh, there, there are lots, the, the lung is structured like a, like a tree that branches and branches until on the very end of the branch, uh, a tiny bubbles, tiny structures called alveoli are found which actually do gas exchange. So this, this, this is what it looks like. One alveoli, less, um, it has a, um, it has alveoli type two and type one cells that line up the border of the alveoli. And right, after, right next to them, there's a blood vessel capillary that has uh, red blood cells that take up oxygen and transport it through the whole organism. And the capillary are lined up with endothelial cells here. And they carry not only red blood cells, but white blood cells that, that are part of our immunity. And in the alveoli, there sits usually a alveolar macrophage that does it, uh, that responds to some in, in case something happens and also it clears uh, surfactant protein that that is generated by uh, alveoli type 2 cell and and so on so when the virus gets into the distal lung it um, it infects alveoli type 2 cell, which also has this, sometimes express this AC2 uh, proteins and team RSS. And this leads to a cascade of events, of molecular events, where a cell reacts to, uh, either reacts to the presence of the virus inside it or dies because the virus uh, exploited the cell. And um, lots of different molecules come out here and this initiate uh, inflammatory reaction basically. So macrophages here sense this and also uh, by other mechanisms white blood cells, lymphocytes from the blood flow start to come into the lung, into the alveoli and uh, try to fight the virus, which leads to this uh, picture. 
where where this membrane and boundary between the capil capillary and the alveolus is is disrupted so there's more uh, fluid coming into the lung and also the particles from the damaged cells and dead cells start to accumulate um, as well as many blood cells white blood cells lymphocytes come to the lung too and all of this creates several uh, pathologies which are called diffuse alveolar damage in general and they, it comprises hyaline membranes uh, composed of different molecules uh, which which start to also line up the same border and more or less all of those things that gradually start to prevent gas exchange and make breathing uh, more difficult and the process of like oxygenation of blood so <clears throat> altogether this this is seen uh, from already a like tissue sections like this so um, this is a this highline membrane formation that covers the uh, border of the alveoli and prevents gas exchange and normal function. Um, this is one alveolus which is filled with small cells that came here and they kind of also prevent the normal function. Um, some, some of the cells lose their natural shape uh, and structure and and this generally starts to uh, happen throughout the lung and the lung which is a healthy lung being a very structured and beautiful sponge uh, which has lots of those important uh, which is designed to produce uh, to, to do those functions uh, loses structure and gives rise to different complications. And this is how it looks like on a bigger scale. So this is the normal lung and on the CT it is black. And this is what is called ground glass opacity. So here you can see uh, that it is very dense. It became dense and it cannot uh, anymore perform its functions. And this is the severe RDS condition. And those pictures are taken right before lung, double lung transplant that happened here at Northwestern uh, for the COVID patient first in the US, if I remember correctly, uh, which was needed because at this point of the damage to the lung, the lung cannot, can no longer do its function and, and uh, it won't repair itself. It probably lost its uh, idea of how to repair itself. And so, the next slide will be what those lungs look like during the uh, lung trans transplantation operation. So this is a trigger warning. You've been warned. This is uh, the healthy lung and this is the lung, those two that, that were taken out of the patient with uh, severe COVID-19. And this left lung belonged to, uh, if I remember correctly, a 23 year old woman. So it's, yes, general statistics tells us about uh, certain age distribution. However, it 
can have severe effects in like you cannot predict and we don't know yes we don't yet know what actually makes this difference why for some people this is so severe why for some other people this is uh completely you know asymptomatic so what are the in injury mechanisms of of this disease so first is direct viral toxicity it is when the virus infects a cell and kills it and it can happen however there are several other things that are involved here and the interplay between them is very complex uh, so again this uh, this this is why we don't yet have definitive answers to those so uh, two of those things are related to ac2 pro protein which is um which has a specific function so it is angiotensin converting enzyme 2 which converts angiotensin 2 enzyme which is a vasoconstrictor peptide and so there's uh, there are two, two proteins that have opposite functions. One, one uh, relaxes the blood flow and uh, decreases the blood pressure. And another constricts the blood vessels and increases the blood tension. And there's a balance between them. And AC2 is a mechanism that regu regulates that balance somewhere in a specific like place where it is expressed locally so when the virus uh binds to those cells it blocks the receptor one and then it destroys the cell that has that receptor so this there's a disbalance with this uh and this is related to this renin angiotensin aldosterone system and also uh, on the endothelial cells that line up the blood vessels, uh, ACE2 is expressed. And so when the virus clears those cells, it, uh, it starts the process of forming thrombos, thrombs in, in the vessels. And so this gives uh, another complication of thrombosis and microthrombs in the lungs and also reported elsewhere in the organ however the biggest maybe thing is immune system and our immune response so immune system is quite complicated and not only uh, beneficial to us some sometimes it acts uh, as a traitor and trying to repair things and uh, clear the virus or infection, it will also injure everything else that it finds. So, so what is, there's a balance to this immune response. Sometimes if it's not enough, the virus will do its work and destroy things. If it's too much, it, the immune system will destroy things and we know it from other diseases too so here particularly there's a mouse hepatitis virus which is another coronavirus it's neurotropic so it infects brain and what we know about this mouse and this virus is that from different experiments is that um, there's there there's a balance to this. So uh, there's a interferon type one uh, signaling, which is part of the immune system, innate immune system. And it is necessary because if we delete those genes in the mice, they succumb to the disease and die. So the same story with T cell responses. Um, they are necessary without them mice die uh, however they're also implicated in the actual destru 
distraction of myelin in the brain, which is, is like a symptom of this disease caused by this virus in the mice. So there, there also are T regulatory cells, usually called T regs, which, which suppress the activity of T cells. So they try to control the level of immune response and they are critical here in this model to suppress uh, immune pathology. And monocytes and macrophages are also implicated in the, in the disease, in, in destroying things. So, so what we did here, uh, this, uh, this is my final part of, the, of my presentation which talks about our recent preprint, which we did here at Northwestern uh, Memorial Hospital with our COVID-19 ICU. So we had around 84 uh, COVID-19 patients and also we had from our history uh, other pneumonias. We had other viral pneumonia and like bacterial and fungal pneumonias, and we compared those from, from all the patients with pneumonias who were enrolled in the study, we collected bronchialveolar lavage fluid. This is a procedure to collect the cells uh, with, with just pressurized liquid, collect the cells that will detach themselves from the alveoli. And this is a way to, to investigate what happens in the alveoli themselves in the distal line. Um, so we collected many of these samples and analyzed them with several methods. One of them, which I will talk about, is single cell RNA sequencing. And it exactly does uh, what I told you before. It measures what each cell is currently making which proteins by which genes. Um, however, before that, this is just a composition of the different cell types which we found in those alveoli. And here you can see on this uh, heat map, you can see the top one is neutrophils, percentage of neutrophils. And here on the left, there's a block of samples that has uh, more neutrophils than this block on the right. And <clears throat> most of those uh, samples come from patients with non-COVID pneumonia. For example, influenza A or other stuff. And, and those, happen, those happen faster than SARS uh, than COVID-19 and uh, more acute inflammation happens there and neutrophils come to the lung to clear this. However, we see a different path in terms of comp composition of cell types for the COVID-19 cluster, which is mostly here. And uh, we have statistical uh, statistical significant presence of T cells compared to other pneumonias, both CD4 and CD8. Uh, and so this just tells us that this is a, a little bit different story from the typical pneumonia and what, and we ask next what uh, could happen, what, what, ha what happens there and we did this uh, single cell RNA sequencing experiments where we looked at each cell, which we found in several samples and tried to uh, describe those cells and gr first group them together by their function and similarity, uh, by their similarity and then infer their function. This is more accurate of what we did. And among other things, we we were able to detect uh, if a cell had SARS-CoV-2 inside it as a virus or not. 
And here, if you can see this uh, graph D, blue highlights <clears throat> this, uh, how many genes from SARS-CoV-2 virus we found in each cell. And there are uh, a few, there are three groups here. One is 82 and 81 cells, and this is as expected, 82 cells, alveolar type two cells, they express AC2 and so they're infected. However, we also found virus in macrophages, uh, which hasn't been reported before, I think. And uh, those two groups of macrophages, they also express uh, several key uh, cytokines and chemokines which whose function uh, is to attract more immune uh, cells into the lung and sort of perpetuate this inflammation that happens and and maybe even spread it so um, So this is the hypothesis that we came up with um, that tells this story, that when the, in the healthy alveoli, there's an AC2 expressing 82 cell, 81 cell, and a macrophage, and they peacefully coexist. However, when SARS-CoV-2 virus enters here and infects 82 cell, uh, it activates macrophages to release those uh, cytokines that will recruit uh, immune cells inside here, which, which will, uh, the recruited cells release another type of cytokines, interferon gamma, which brings more macrophages into the same alveoli and more macrophages bring more T cells. And so this is their uh, way of having a positive feedback loop, which, which we think slowly spreads uh, in the lung from alveoli to the next. And so this is uh, why COVID-19 is slower and also more um, has more burden on the general system because of the level of those inflammatory signaling that are released here constantly uh, throughout the course of the disease. So with this, I want I want to thank all the colleagues that worked on this and there's more than 100 uh, and it, many studies now with uh, about COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2 are huge studies and I want to pass microphone to Virgil. Uh, thank you so much. Sorry. Um, before before Perl starts uh, his speech, could I suggest everyone to ask their questions? Uh, just like to, to take a short break, to sip some wine and maybe to just to, to help people think on, on what we just heard because that's, that's really incredible. That's a huge study. And my, my personal ask today is how exactly the virus uh, targets uh, the the right cell, like the the organ, uh, whether it's lungs or liver or any other. How it happens, like how it chooses uh, the real target. Um, my my answer is like most of the things in biology, random. So it just so happens that. Well, if you touch the virus with your hand, nothing will happen because your hand does not have cells that express AC2. And so you can just then wash your hand and uh, be happy. Uh, 
However, if the virus gets into your mouth and nose and, and there by pure chance finds a cell, then the infection can start. And then virus, well, it evolved to, um, to suppress some of the functions of, the, of our immune system, uh, like interferon one signaling. And so it, it has some mechanisms that it evolved to do, but I think it, it, it goes to the lung naturally just because of the breathing and because it initially harbors somewhere already in the respiratory tract. And so it gets to the lung like just influenza A or other uh, respiratory infection. However, if it escapes the lungs or not is I think still a question. However, uh, I, I personally think that it does and there are some reports of the virus being seen outside of the lungs which is not typical for respiratory infection. Um, and there it is, if it happens, it is brought there by different systems, mainly by blood flow. And so because of how, you know, this is built, if, if something gets in the blood, it will end up in the heart, it will end up in the kidneys, it will go through the liver and all of those places act like filters and if they have any susceptible cells the virus can end up there i have a question about uh, the virus in the brain which uh, cells are targeted in the brain it seems that the, 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 there are some different hypotheses but is it known right now I, I don't have this answer. So I've seen, I think, one or two reports that the virus uh, gets to the brain. Uh, I would say that macrophages, again, because they usually they are the cells that eat different things and some including the virus. And sometimes uh, the virus can infect the macrophage via uh, antibody dependent enhancement or via some other unknown things. So I would say that macrophages in the brain microglia are probably the target uh, cells, but I will write it down. Yeah, I, I actually read about uh, choroid plaque plexus because it's kind of in, in the um, epithelial type of cells in, in the brain. And also some astrocytes, but uh, it's still kind of not not well known, and and still some controversial uh, opinions on that. Um, I think everyone else uh, also has a lots of questions, but in general, you give such statistics regarding possible complications in the heart or even septic shocks, which is really impressive. Could you please clarify uh, how exactly does uh, the virus work on them? Does it differ from the lung disease somehow? And uh, how exactly does it affect the whole body? Я прошу прощения, что встреваю с двумя комментариями. Во-первых, все понимают по-русски, и вопрос можно задавать по-русски. Да, а во-вторых, может быть, мы, как вы думаете, и как ты, Соня, думаешь, может быть, а после этого вопроса мы перенесем оставшиеся вопросы на конец, чтобы дать Петру еще то же время. Конечно, конечно. Что вы думаете? Ага, и да, да, прошу прощения, что встретил. Я отвечу очень кратко, что большинство из этих осложнений, которые случаются и там описаны, они уже не имеют отношения к вирусу. Это, это как бы побочные следствия того, что организму в целом плохо. This is what I answered you in, in the chat, that the part of the problem of severe COVID is a runaway immune response. 
So uh, the body starts with doing the right thing, recognizing the enemy and trying to fight the enemy. But then the, this, this army, this defense army goes haywire and, uh, and basically floods the body with all the substances that are used for uh, fighting of the infection with all the deleterious effects. And the, in the end, the reason that there is so many different systems in the body affected is that all, all those uh, signaling substances that fight infection have uh, uh, untoward effect of endothelium. And endothelial cells are not only the cells that are lining up the lungs, but they, uh, they are lining up all of our vessels and basically are represented in all organs. So that's why you have lots of problems with uh, um, thrombus formation. That's why you have a, a problems with uh, renal insufficiency. That's what you, why you find, um, and I don't know what is, what is the transfer, and uh, Nick was trying to explain, why you find the RNA, uh, viral RNA also in, in the brain. But basically it's completely uncontrollable um, overreaction to the infection that, that, that was at the beginning. Um, with this, I will take a floor and um, let me see, share, how do I share? Do you see my screen? Yes, we do. Okay. So I have to make the same uh, disclaimer that Nick have <clears throat> made at the beginning. I cannot claim to be in any way, shape or form a specialist in COVID infection. I am a practicing anesthesiologist. And since in the last group that I worked, my function was the director of uh, the education for the group. Um, I, uh, at the beginning of the infection, did a lot of uh, reading uh, about uh, the virus uh, because uh, no one knew much of anything. Uh, and I helped developing the workflow of the patients uh, through the operating room and uh, our protection, patient protection, other patients and personnel in the hospital protections and so on and so forth. So what I'm presenting is basically based on uh, reading and my interest uh, uh, that started in uh, March and April. Uh, and uh, as we were dividing the um, as we were dividing our duties for today's presentation, uh, we decided with Nick that I will talk to you about the vaccines and the therapeutics. So the vaccines approaches, and before we will start about the vaccines, I think it would be very important to very quickly review the normal immune response to the COVID infection. And I cannot do it without just giving you a very, very skinny of uh, what the immune uh, system is. And basically you have two different uh, type of very spe specialized cells that are respons responsible for immune response in the body. So um, these are, let me just do the pointer here. Uh, these are the T cells, which are represented here, uh, and the B cells. So T cells have two functions, roughly speaking. One of the functions is uh, recognized. So aniras vietchiki prosto. They are supposed to sniff around and figure out: is it my my tissue, not my tissue? Is it uh, is it enemy or is it a friend? Um, the second, uh, and they also serve as a memory cell. So once they recognize something as an enemy, they will keep it in in the in the in the rep repetitious way in the in the further in the in the new generations of the cells they will remember that they have seen something that they considered uh, the enemy the second type of t-cells are directly cytotoxic so basically their role is to chew up the uh, body cells that were infected with the enemy so that would be a, a t-cells and t-cells the the name t is coming from thymus because they are differentiating in a small gland that sits right in the middle of your upper, upper chest uh, around the trachea, uh, very close to your thyroid gland. The second type of the cells that, uh, that are represented uh, in the immune system are B cells. And the B cells are differentiated in the um, 
peripheral glands, um, lymph, lymph nodes, and, and they are very, very richly represented in the spleen. And they have a little different uh, role. Uh, yes, there are some B cells that serve as memory cells, but first and foremost, they are responsible for production of immunoglobins. And in, immunoglobins are basically a small protein fragments that can directly bind to the antigen. Antigen is something that is represented on the enemy's uh, cells or the surface, uh, for, well, virus is not a cell per se. It's a small uh, bunch of protein with the genetic material, but it is covered with what we call antigens because for our body, it is an antigen. So basically immunoglobin's role is to bind to, um, to the antigen and by this kind of uh, signing them up for CD8 uh, cells or cytotoxic cells, monocytes and all the other cells that basically do the cleanup job. Uh, so, and this is a timeline of the response, normal response of the human to a COVID infection. So first, uh, first of all, of all, you have uh, those um, CD4 T cells, which are memory re recognized and mem memory cells that will um, be um, uh, reacting to it. Uh, and then, of course, uh, there, through intersignaling between T cells and B cells, you have a huge expansions of the B cells, and then production of uh, immunoglobin uh, M A and immunoglobin G. Uh, but what is important to see is that around six months, basically you have, assuming that the, you, the body has su su successfully fought this infection, there is no sign of uh, any response, um, which is good uh, because part of the COVID problem is that there is no end to the reaction and it fuels the fires that is, that is very difficult to quash. Um, good part is that those CD4 memory cells and B memory cells do have encoded already recognition of this enemy and they can react very quickly uh, for in, in the infection to follow. As an example, anecdotally, and there's only two or three reports um, uh, so far, uh, about the patients who are reinfected several weeks after the initial infection or curing the initial COVID infection, are reinfected uh, with COVID. And one probably best described um, and first very well described case from Hong Kong, the patient had relatively severe, but not, 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 not to, to the extreme um, COVID uh, infection. And a few months later, a couple of months later, uh, he was tested again uh, for presence of the uh, virus. He was completely asymptomatic. And sure enough, uh, he was colonized with the virus, which only means that his, all, his own immune system through the memorization of this previous infection was able to mount the appropriate uh, response and he did not have a full blown uh, infection. Uh, so again, importance of this natural response is the dynamics of uh, antibody ups and downs and quite possibly the, uh, the vaccines that will be developed will require uh, two doses to bump, uh, bump up uh, initial response and probably yearly, if not more frequent, redosing to keep uh, the uh, to keep the immunized, immune, immune system in tune for possible infection. And, and then the blessing of the memory of CD4 and memory B cells uh, with speed and response to reinfection. So how to make a vaccine? Historically, um, vaccine was made basically by taking the virus that is of interest to us, putting it in, into a bunch of uh, um, eggs that were fertilized, having them grow in this egg and then processing them further. Um, nowadays, for the most part, uh, uh, the manufacturers are moving to human cell lines, uh, which are much cleaner. There is no risk of uh, infection with using the eggs and it's just cleaner process, be it more difficult to accomplish, but it's cleaner. The second is recombination techniques. I'll show you nice pictures about that and, 
And then the third is genetic engineering techniques um, where, where basically you can take the simple elements of the genetic material and put it together all, all in a dish from scratch, from, from building, from elemental building elements. So um, classically, this is, this is how it looks. Uh, you take um, uh, a cell culture or egg, you take the virus that you're interested in growing, put it uh, into this culture or egg and let it grow. This accomplishes two things. One is you have a bunch of the virus that you need uh, to make a vaccine. Two is depending on how this culture is fed, this culture fluid is fed, what are the condition, you can render the virus that is initially virulent, meaning it can cause the disease in human, and you can make it through how it is cultured, no longer um, causing a disease in a human, and yet still uh, expressing all the antigenicity that we are interested in. So then you uh, put this fluid, um, clean it, centrifuge it, purify it, and then you do a bunch of different things with it, depending on what type of um, vaccine you are interested in, and we'll talk about it in a second. And then it's the issue of basically the whole industrial process, fill, inspect, label, package, ship out. This is, uh, the, rep the, this is the recombinant technique, and this, this virus, this, this is particularly the hepatitis B virus. So it's not cell, cell in itself, but it's, it's a uh, protein expressing outer uh, layer. Uh, and inner layer has the genetic material. So you basically take a slice uh, of this genetic material that you're interested in, you incorporate it in the genetic material of some other cell. And the yeast is a very popular cell because it's a big and it's very nice and easy and clean to culture. So if you incorporate the gene for production of this small, what is called surface, protein, sur surface antigen. So this is how this green dot represent the surface antigen. You will put it in the genetic material of, of the yeast and all of a sudden the yeast starts producing a bunch of this protein that you're interested in. And then you again purify it and, and this, is your, uh, this is your vaccine. And then I would like to turn your attention only to this part of this slide, which is genetic uh, material uh, that is encoding uh, of the spike protein. You can build this again from, from the el single elements and you basically only produce the genes that are encoding uh, the spike protein production uh, and then you inject it to a human cells and they, the, the human cells start producing the spike protein without the other virus proteins. Um, and the body uh, starts reacting to the spike protein and uh, producing uh, an antibodies and memorizing the spike protein as an enemy. So in the future, this will shield you from being protect be, to, from being infected by something that uh, expresses a spike protein as the antigen on the surface. So all of the vaccine. Um, uh, candidates that are being worked on are uh, targeting the spike protein as a target of response, of, of immune response of our bodies. Uh, so the question of course is how to deliver the spike protein to the cells. So you, we can either use the whole virus, which is either weakened so that it's no longer infected or inactive, in other words, killed or fragmented. You can use other viruses, uh, either replicating viruses, meaning that they will divide in our bodies or non-replicating, but they will have genetic material in them that will be uh, uh, steering the production of the spike protein in, in the human cells. Or you can inject just DNA or RNA that is encoding production of spike protein. And in the end, you can also uh, inject the spike protein itself. So either the whole spike S protein fragment or the subunits of the spike, the ones that are responsible 
for linking to this ACE2 um, uh, receptor that Nick was talking about. So in the graphic form, this is how it looks. So you can use the virus COVID-19 that is weakened or inactive. So in other words, you weakened uh, the virus by culturing it in a very specific way to render it no longer infective. But it will do its, its, its thing. Number one, it will, uh, it will have a spike protein on the surface, but more importantly, it will enter human cell and it will um, spur the cell to, into production of the uh, anti-spike protein uh, antibodies, antibodies. Or this virus can be inactive, which, mean, which means killed uh, or fragmented. Then you can use another virus and uh, other popular viruses, and we'll talk about it in a second, can be used. And those viruses have this fragment that is encoding uh, spike protein uh, production um, uh, in them. Uh, and then, again, it can be replicating virus or non-replicating virus. And then we were talking that you can use only DNA or RNA that is encoding spike protein production and inject this directly to the human body. And in the end, you can also inject either virus-like particle, which is basically a shell. It does not have any genetic material, but it is covered with the spike protein, or you can inject spike protein or subunits of spike protein itself. So whole virus inactivated, how is it done? It is grown in the cells, industrial production, it takes time, so that's um, uh, why we're still waiting for this. Um, this plus, of course, the all, all phases of clinical trials that, that we need to have. It is killed and fragmented uh, with chemical radiation of, uh, or heat. Plus, it can be given to even to immunocompromised patients. It does not, uh, you, you're not risking that patient will actually have a fully blown infection um, with, uh, with the virus which is inactivated. Uh, the con is that the, it, it has a relatively weak immune response and requires boost doses. So that would be a candidate that every few months you would have to have a booster to keep the immunity, at least in season, uh, that the COVID will be circulating, and it will be circulating. The predictions are it will become one of the kind of the flu viruses of the future. It, it, you, you will have seasons of, of flu and seasons of, uh, seasons of COVID. So example of uh, whole virus which was inactivated is your flu vaccine. Uh, and the, it, in, in the fight against COVID-19, this is a prevailing Chinese uh, efforts approach. Multiple companies in China are working on the whole virus uh, inacti in, inactivated form. Attenuated is the one that, again, it is cultured and it is genetically weakened. So by tweaking how it is cultured in a tissue culture on, on eggs, uh, you, may, you render it no longer ineffective. So it's a normal virus. It has all the antigenicity of the normal virus, but it should not give you a fully blown uh, infection. Uh, you can now build this weakened virus from scratch. Uh, the genetical engineering is so far that you no longer have to culture it. But again, it takes time. The the pro of using this approach, it, it's a stronger response and longer acting immunity, uh, lasting immunity. The con is it cannot be given to immunocompromised pa patients and it requires refrigeration. So if you, if you imagine that uh, one of your tasks will be to immunize everybody in sub-Saharan sub Africa, uh, it, has, it, is a, uh, it is a headache. Though the, though the organization with which I work is specializing in this type in a cold chain, uh, cold chain for vaccines as well. So example of, of uh, vaccines that are already um, uh, produced with this approach is chickenpox and yellow fever. Uh, there is no clinical trials with the attenuated uh, virus at this point. So again, we have covered uh, those two things, which is coronavirus, either weakened or inactive. Now we will go to another type of the virus, uh, which is different virus type, but it has in it the part of the genetic material which uh, induces our cells to produce um, um, spike protein. So you basically use a carrier virus, which is benign to humans. And it can be, for example, attenuated flu virus or measles. You take 
uh, its own genetic material and modify it uh, to have a fragment that, uh, that encodes the production of the spike protein. The pro is that it has a, it gives you a strong in, uh, immune response. And if you're using replicating virus, less virus is needed because it multiplies in the host. So you have enough of the expression of the antigen that you want to have recognized and fought um, if, you, in, if you're using a replicating virus. A con, uh, it, it, it requires much longer safety testing uh, than, than the protein or nucleic mat material. And again, it needs refrigeration. And Merck is working on this type of uh, the vaccine right now. Um, and non-replicating, non the same, exactly the same principle. Uh, the popular viruses uh, used here is adenovirus and rabies. Uh, and again, you insert the genetic material for spike uh, protein production. Response, response is stronger. Um, some, some no need of refrigeration, but the problem is that if it's not non-replicating, then you have to have much more of this uh, virus uh, grown in a dish and injected to the human in order to have enough of the an antigen um, produced within the body to, uh, to render the response. Um, and these are AstraZeneca, and you heard in the news a lot about the AstraZeneca, and we can cover this in your Q&A session. And Gamaleya, which you also heard, uh, this is the only, uh, quote, and approved, end quote, vaccine so far. And I'll talk about the fact why it is not really approved and why it's not even, uh, shouldn't be even considered the vaccine at this point. Oh, yes, please. Everyone is quite interested. All right. Uh, so we covered uh, this group now. Now we'll go to DNA, RNA. So you basically take a naked genetic material, which is responsible for encoding of, of protein mass. It's very easy to mass produce and, and change with different viruses. So you can use it, you can use this approach theoretically at least for multiple, multiple different bi diseases. Uh, uh, it does not require refrigeration, but it has relatively, uh, uh, it, it gives a relatively weak immune response and you, you need adjuvants that will kick up this uh, immune response after the, uh, uh, this material is injected. And Moderna is another company that you have heard a lot about because this was the first, first company that started actually clinical studies in US and in the world, I think. Uh, so we will hear about it much more and Pfizer is also working on and, and they are both working on RNA based um, uh, vaccine. And finally, the last, uh, last group that we're talking is it's protein subunits. So it's either the whole spike protein or the subunit that is responsible for binding to uh, ACE2 receptor. Uh, it's recombinant uh, technology. So you grow it in the dish in the cells, but you grow it basically from a, from a basic uh, uh, element. It's a pro is very easy to mass produce, uh, but it requires more time obviously than RNA and DNA because it's not only genetic material, it's genetic material that has to be injected into the cells and the cells have to produce enough of the protein to make it uh, reasonable. Uh, con is that it's not a strong immune response and needs adjuvants again. And Novavax is the company that you might have heard about uh, and that is producing um, uh, this type of protein. And th then final group is a virus-like protein. So I told you, it's a, it's a shell, uh, but it's a shell that on the surface has the protein as that we're interested in our body of fighting. So it's an empty, sorry, it's an empty uh, S-protein shell. It enters cell like a virus, but does not replicate. There's no genetic material. It, it, uh, it renders a strong response, uh, relatively quick to produce, but very difficult to produce. Uh, so stability, purity, and difficulty of production is, uh, is, is a, a stumbling block here. There is one developer um, that is working on this type of uh, the vaccines, and existing ones are vaccines for um, 
human papillovirus and hepatitis B. Now the scale of the effort is 100 teams uh, working and historically uh, the failure rate for vaccine candidates is 94%. So let's say if 100 teams are working, that means that six will have a decent, will be a decent candidates for vaccine. And then the phase two and three trials will probably see the out of those uh, some percentage as well. 11 are in phase one clinical trials, and I'll explain what clinical trials are. 13 in phase two and six in phase three. And AstraZeneca just restarted after one major complication. There was one patient who developed what is called a trans, um, transverse myelitis, which is extremely severe complication, which is uh, oftentimes autoimmune. It can be bacterial, but it's oftentimes autoimmune. So that was a very, very, very quick red flag for the manufacturer of this vaccine candidate. And they held the study. Uh, they just restarted, but they restarted it in Brazil and Australia. They did not restart, restart human studies in US. I guess US uh, regulators are still not uh, happy with uh, vetting of this one case, and we will see where it goes. There's one quote, approved end quote, uh, uh, Gamalea, um, uh, vaccine, uh, but there are multiple things here. For all practical purposes, this vaccine candidate went only through uh, phase one clinical studies, uh, meaning that 37 people were injected with two different uh, types of this vaccine in two different doses and uh, antibodies against uh, protein S were found in their serum as a response. And no one died or uh, no one died or had many major complications. There were no phase two and three studies done, and we'll talk about what phase two and three studies are in a second. And uh, about 30 different um, um, uh, serious researchers from uh, several continents have written a letter to the editor of, of Lancet, if I remember correctly, about two weeks after the study was published raising a very, very serious, uh, how to put it mildly, doubts about quality of data that was presented. The raw data was not presented. The graphs of the responses was presented and there were very curious duplications um, of the data and the response of those patients uh, presented in the graphs that are um, almost impossible in the normal distribution of statistics to replicate. So um, I, I put it into no, nowhere near the vaccine uh, category at this point. So again, just to summarize, what are the platforms? You can use either genetic material only. You can use another virus which will have the genetic material that is responsible for encoding of the protein S. You can use um, uh, protein, spike protein itself or subunits of spike protein, uh, uh, protein S. You can use uh, the replicating virus, which is attenuated. You can use a non-replicating virus that is attenuated, and you can use the virus that is inactivated, which is chemically or thermically killed, but still expressing as protein. And so these are the approaches possible for vaccine formation. And this is how it basically um, um, divides into what, wh which principle is used by how many manufacturers. So protein-based are most um, popular. Uh, China is working for the most part uh, with uh, live attenuated and inactivated virus. So these are Chinese approaches. Uh, and then you have RNA, DNA um, uh, approaches to the vaccine. Now, vaccine candidate clinical studies. We were talking about phase one, and one two, and three. So phase one study is basically you take healthy volunteers uh, 20, 30 of volunteers. Uh, by now, you know from your animal studies that uh, what you think will be a vaccine does something to the body and elicits some kind of a response. So you inject it to human, cross your fingers and hope that nothing bad will happen. 
and that you will actually find the antibodies product produced against this antigen that you have injected or the genetic materials that is supposed to express itself in the human cells and spur the human cells to produce this antigen. So this is basically safety and dose ranging study. Very small, healthy people only. Phase two is efficacy and side effects. So you're looking uh, for how robust is this response that you're looking for. Uh, do you have consistently, are you consistently finding the antibodies against the antigen that you're interested in find, find, uh, fighting? And, um, and you're looking for side, this is the first time that you start looking for side effects. So you have usually a few hundred subjects um, and the fact that you are finding consistently the um, antibodies does not, mean, does not mean that you will have a good therapeutic effect. So efficacy does not equal therapeutic effect. So you may find that the vaccine candidate is efficient, meaning it, it uh, gives you a response of the body that you are hoping for, but it doesn't mean that it protects you against the infection. And only in phase three, large populational studies, you can look also for um, therapeutic effect uh, and safety. Uh, because you, if you uh, inoculate a large um, chunk of population, that means that will be the people that will have, through their communities, contact with the virus. So then you can tease out this group that was inoculated with uh, a, a real thing versus the group that was inoculated with placebo and see what was the percentage of the people that um, uh, avoided uh, COVID infection versus uh, in the group that were inoculated with a vaccine candidate versus the people which were given only a placebo. And also you're looking for rare but severe complications. So um, this uh, AstraZeneca uh, red flag uh, was exactly during the phase three where you have several thousand people and actually they all, all of those vaccine manufacturers are targeting somewhere between 20 and 40,000 people that will be in, uh, in the study between the um, between the therapeutic uh, arm and the placebo arm. So again Russians have to taken 37 people uh, injected a couple of doses of uh, those um, uh, vaccine candidates, and they found the ant antibodies and the statistics that they presented are questionable in itself. There was no phase two and no phase three study, so we will see where it goes. Okay, quick breather. Um, we will switch to treatment, and it will be very disappointing. And the reason it is disappointing because the whole uh, medical community is disappointed because there is very little to be said about um, treatment um, as far as medications uh, are concerned. Uh, so first of all, what the treatment is not indicated for. Uh, there is nothing that will prevent you from getting infected. So don't take medications to keep you from being infected. There is also no indication for post-exposure prophylaxis. So if you have been exposed to someone you, uh, you self-isolate, you watch for symptoms, and you wait what happens. If nothing happens, that means you were able, either you were not infected or you were infected and you quietly have fought the infection. Um, it is not indicated also for asymptomatic COVID patients. So now we have a patient who is proven to be infected with COVID virus. You still don't treat. You let the body do its do its job. When you start having um, mild symptoms, mild respiratory symptoms, myalgia, fever, typical symptoms of viral infection, but you have no, disp no dyspnea, meaning you're not short of breath, you don't have hypoxia or low oxygen blood levels, and you don't have risk factors, you still do nothing. So you let the body do whatever the body is designed to do. Uh, so the treatment is uh, supportive for the most part, even the treatment of the patients who are more severely sick. Uh, outcomes have improved ever since this uh, 
pandemic have started. Um, for the most part, because we are, I think, uh, understanding much better how to give supportive treatment, including ICU treatment, a little differently than at the beginning. So, for example, there was a move from uh, immediate uh, intubation of all the patients who had low uh, oxygen levels to advanced non-invasive support. And I'll show you a, 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 a strangely looking example of it in a second. And then a good ICU care and understanding of quick, uh, of frequent change position and putting patient in a prone position, which means face down position. And basically when you have already patients who require ventilation, who have severe pneumonia related to COVID and even ARDS, um, the, the ICU teams have learned to be very proactive, aggressive, and how the supportive care is, is given. Anticoagulation uh, protocols were developed because of the uh, high prevalence of uh, thrombotic, uh, meaning, what is the lay word? Um, preventing development of small clots in the small vessels, which leads to choking up different tissues uh, of oxygen because there's no blood flowing to them. So renal insufficiency, liver insufficiency, and so forth. So this is an example of uh, rather than putting tube in everybody uh, and putting tube is life savings and there's class of patients that will always need an intubation, but ventilation of the patients itself is destructive to the lungs, especially certain types of the ventilation. So um, we, we, we now have protocols for uh, uh, so-called uh, um, lung sparing ventilation with low volumes, with relatively high end expiratory pressure, but low volumes, uh, and, and trying basically not to stretch the, uh, the, the lines too much because this in itself is distracting, especially in face of ravaging infection. So this is an example of um, kind of a margin costume looking thing that is supposed to deliver constant positive pressure. So it's basically, uh, as you see, it's relatively tight collar around the face here, and you can you can give uh, oxygen enriched air to the patient with certain overpressure of a face uh, of a face, so the the pressure never goes down to atmospheric pressure, and that spares many people from being intubated and ventilated. Now, this is the kicker, and this is why we're all grasping straws in the medical community. There's absolutely no approved, fully approved medical treatment for COVID, okay? All the medications that I use are approved on emergency basis. So the word that you have, uh, the name that you have heard the most is remdesivir, uh, and that's the antiviral medication, and I'll show you a, a picture of it in a second. Uh, through rigorous studies, uh, uh, it was established that uh, hydroxy hydroxychloroquine um, is not adding anything to uh, either prevention or treatment of, uh, of the COVID. And this is of the book. You have just recently heard about the convalescent plasma controversy and the crossing of the politics and medicine uh, to the detriment of medicine, if you ask me. And then you have heard probably about the dexamethasone. And again, it, it, it is becoming part of the protocol in more severe uh, sick patients, and I'll show you why. And there is a promise of injectable injury and antibodies. So rather than having our bodies produce, un produce antibody, you produce antibody in the dish and you inject the antibodies. And that's Eli Lilly, uh, and you could, uh, you could probably hear or read something in the paper last few days or a couple of weeks. Uh, the problem is cost, it's incredibly expensive, and you need tons of this stuff, uh, even for a single patient. So if we are talking uh, millions of infected people, that's prohibitively expensive and cumbersome. So, HCQ, it is popular anti-malarial. It's also used in lupus. Again, in controlled human studies, there was no benefit. It didn't shorten the disease. It didn't weaken the response. It didn't save any lives. And uh, in addition, it, uh, it has some inherent risk of cardiac toxicity uh, for, 
forget about it, to say it in New Yorker accent. Convalescent plasma, what is the concept here? So you basically have people who have been subject to COVID-19 infection and they were successful in fighting this infection. And the reason they were successful in fighting this infection because they produced uh, neutralizing antibodies. So they have basically neutralizing antibodies that are circulating in the blood. So you take blood from those people and through the process called apheresis, where you separate all the cell elements, blood, red blood cells, white blood cells, platelets, and what is left is only the fluid in which those cells are suspended in the whole blood. And this fluid, which is called plasma, contains those smaller protein part particles that are called antibodies. So these are COVID-2 neutralizing antibodies. And you transfuse them to someone who is suffering from COVID infection. So there is some success in this so far. Uh, about 20,000 patients were treated so far, but it's relatively narrow effectiveness. So uh, it serves patients who are below 80 years of age. It has to be, a plasma has to be, has to have a high titer, meaning high concentrations of those uh, neutralizing antibodies. So not every patient who fought the infection is a good candidate for it. Um, the patients have to have a moderate disease. So it does not do much for patients who are already on the ventilator. Um, and it has a relative risk in this constellation, it leads to relative risk reduction of progressing to more severe disease. Brandesivir, uh, lots of buzzword because this was the first medication that was uh, um, uh, approved on an emergency basis by the FDA. So uh, Nick showed you that uh, virus is basically binding to ACE2 inhibitor, uh, which is expressed on the cell membrane. Goes, goes into the cell into the cell, and then produces more of the RNA or genetic material to replicate itself. And what remdesivir does, it enters the cell and it blocks the RNA polymerase by this causing a production of the faulty RNA. So virus cannot basically replicate or the replication of the virus is impeded. And CNN, papers, uh, everything was blowing the horn about it. But uh, if you look at the clinical studies, uh, remdesivir has a very limited uh, effectiveness. So um, it basically did not, this is not statistically uh, significant difference in, in mortality rates. So it does not change the mortality. And moderately, severely sick patients, it uh, decreased the hospitalization length. Um, that's the claim to the fame so far in, in, in rigorous studies. Dexamethasone, very cheap and popular, uh, long acting uh, 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 steroid um, used on a daily basis in the hospital. Um, this is statistical analysis of the patients that were given um, uh, uh, dexamethasone. Uh, in the patients who did not require oxygen, it did not do anything. The number one means it's neutral. Everything to the right of number one is, if anything, it is deleterious effect. Uh, and everything to the left is benefit from using the medication. So in the patients who required oxygen, but did not require ventilation, there is a benefit, and in patients who require uh, ventilation, there is bigger benefit. So all in all, for patients who require oxygen but are breathing spontaneously, and in patients who, are, who have low blood level oxygens to the point that they, they require mechanical ventilation, there is benefit of, of giving dexamethasone. And if you want to, if in a graphical form, basically of the patients who require oxygen or are ventilated, uh, about a third of them uh, will, will be rescued from dying. So if you have 100 patients on the ventilator, um, dexamethasone will buy, bail out about one third of them from dying. 
Okay, so that's that's about the treatment, and it was a short uh, and sweet because there is not much to be said about it. Uh, Nick wanted me to uh, mention uh, clinical studies um, about the interleukin blockers. Again, very expensive, all done by genetical engineering. So far, disappointing. Um, uh, interleukins uh, is are part of those messengers of inflammation. Um, and the thought was that if we are trying to, if we, if, if, if we had a scenario of runaway inflammation with overproduction of interleukin, and there's a bunch of them, six of them for them, for that matter. Uh, if we block off one of those interleukins, we will hopefully still have immune system going, but without self-destructive properties. So far, there is no benefit as far as mortality and morbidity in blocking interleukins. Now, if you are uh, alternative medicine minded and you would like to have from me uh, some of scientifically uh, not vetted um, or as vetted as uh, alternative medicine can be, uh, how to, um, here's your two slides on that. So this is not really prevention. All of those medications and uh, supplements are supposed to make you less sick in case you will get infected. So quercetin is the, um, uh, you, you drink it, part of you are drinking it today uh, with a red wine. It's an extract from, uh, from the red grapes. Uh, you can take this twice a day. Vitamin C, no, no need of explanation. Zinc is actually proven scientifically to impede the um, intrusion of the viruses. It is used in common cold. You can buy lozenges uh, in your corner pharmacy. And if you start having sniffles, start, uh, start uh, sucking on those uh, zinc lozenges and the chances that you will be less severe sick. Uh, vitamin D, 5,000 units uh, a daily, it's basically generally to decrease the inflammatory response if something happens to you uh, or unnecessary part of uh, inflammatory response. Everybody actually should have vitamin D checked and uh, this is the supplement that uh, should be quite popular because it has also preventative uh, properties as far as having um, coronary artery disease, hypertension, and so on and so forth. Selenium, uh, again, buyer of the uh, inflammatory response, and melatonin just for general health. And uh, if you sleep well, and if you have enough of the sleep, you generally speaking have a better immune system. Uh, so uh, that's just to keep you, keep you nicely falling asleep and easily falling asleep. Now, if you're sick, you can try to increase zinc and increase uh, vitamin C. You can add elder, elder, elderberry and actually acetylcysteine is, um, uh, there is some uh, checked and vetted benefit in viral infections in modifying the, the response of the body if you are taking uh, N-acetylcysteine and you will find it easily online if, if you so desire. Um, however, until we have an effective, effective vaccine, uh, these are the steps that all of us have to take. Distance, mask, hand hygiene, and no gatherings inside. To what extent uh, mask and distancing uh, are effective? Uh, just today, I think the report was uh, uh, posted on comparison of first six months of this year um, of the common cold infections and flu infections versus uh, the same period last year. And, but by leaps and bounces, the, the number of uh, people with the, with the flu this year is lower than last year. And it's probably uh, to, due to the fact that people are distancing and wearing masks. It's the same way of spreading uh, droplet in contact. Uh, so um, most of us is, are now distancing and wearing masks. So do more of that. And then we wait for the vaccine and the most optimistic predictions are the vaccine will be available sometime mid 2021. 
when it will be available to the masses, who the hell knows? Um, probably um, the, 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 the immunizations will go first and foremost to the healthcare providers, um, then to the elderly and people with comorbidities, uh, then to first responders. So you will have your policemen and firemen and uh, clerks in the store who are checking you out and drivers in the mass transit and so on and so forth and then to the general population. So good luck, line up, and let's wait. That's all I have. Just amazing. Like, I'm, I'm so impressed. Thank you so much, Nicola and Peter. Um, and let's switch to the question because uh, I'm, I'm really overwhelmed. So I suggest everyone just to jump in with the questions. So if I may, uh... Is there any medical data as to um, level of oxygen in people who are uh, going through the, the sickness without symptoms? А я в клинике скажу, что все понимают по-русски. Я я по-русски тоже понимаю. Вопросы могут быть по-русски, но мне легче будет отвечать по-английски. Извините, пожалуйста. Да, конечно. There was a phenomenon at the beginning of, uh, of uh, the COVID infection of so-called, uh, how do they call it, comfortable uh, hypoxemics or relaxed hypoxemics. People who were coming to ED with very mild effects, they could be maybe a little short of breath, but not much, maybe a little heart rate increase, but by no much. Uh, and, and when the pulse oximeter was applied to them, they had dangerously low levels of, uh, of oxygen. Um, and that was uh, just a testament to the fact that the gate to the infection is mostly located in the lungs and the first organ that is targeted is lungs. Uh, and all the mechanisms that Nick explained to you and thickening of those membranes uh, lining the, the bubbles uh, through which the oxygen exchange is taking place. So you can, you can see people with uh, very low levels um, and being relatively comfortable from clinical standpoint. And these were the people that we had learned not to jump and put the tube in and put additional stress on the lungs by ventilating them mechanically, stretching them uh, and adding um, insult to injury. Rather, uh, put them, th those people in the prone position, ch changing the position. So the fluids that are accumulating in the lungs will be distributing evenly, evenly through the lungs, giving them those strangely looking devices called CPAP, uh, which stands for continuous positive airway pressure hoods and different other measures like high flow nasal oxygen cannula, which creates also co uh, continuous positive airway pressure. And we've learned to, to maximize those types of the treatments rather than jumping uh, and ventilating everybody. How about the public health protocol? Has it really changed worldwide? Or you see that it changes like in some severe countries or uh, in some exact uh, more vulnerable, uh, like... So you're talking about the health, uh, kind of a uh, public health uh, protocols? Yeah. Okay, so this best example in a very hotly debated was Scandinavia, of course, right? So you had Sweden, that they said at the beginning, okay, uh, we would like to, and to some extent Britain as well, at the, at the very, very, very beginning. So the thought in Sweden was, okay, we will protect our elderly, uh, so we will make sure that they are isolated, very strict isolation rules in, in the elderly houses. Uh, but the rest of the country will basically stay relatively open. So uh, the restaurants will be open, the schools will be open. I did not check it uh, recently, but last time I checked, which was about, about a month uh, ago, oh, and, and the thought of doing it was, we will gain, this way we will gain the herd immunity much quicker. Herd immunity is basically when about 60-70% of the population had the contact with the virus and developed the immunity towards the virus and basically it stopped the spread of the virus. So if you have a critical mass of the population 
that has antibodies and it can recognize the virus and fight the virus, the virus doesn't have hosts to spread and basically dies off to a certain extent. It will come back, come back in the next wave, but you have what is called herd immunity. Well, the only thing that the uh, Swedes have accomplished was about three, four times mortality in their country as compared to Denmark, Norway, and Finland, which directly encircled them and which had much stricter uh, uh, health, uh, uh, public health policies with uh, lockdown initially and much slower coming back to full functionality uh, than, uh, than in, in, in Sweden. And again, I don't know what, what last uh, month or two, uh, how those statistics are looking, uh, but I know that they also failed in protecting the elderly and they had a very, very high uh, percentage of the uh, COVID people um, who were uh, 65 plus who succumbed to, to COVID. Uh, hi, Peter, a uh, question. What do we know about the mutation of this virus and, and uh, then what, how effective would be vaccine in case like if it's mutated? By now, from what I know, there are four or six um, uh, different mutations of the virus. What is very lucky for us is spike protein and especially this subunit that is binding to ACE2 inhibitor is expressed on all of the, on all of the uh, uh, mutations. So that's why uh, I told you that uh, spike protein, it's all about spike protein. So hopefully um, there will be no mutations that will be changing the spike protein. So basically everybody who was working on vaccine has a good target. Okay, thank Peter, you. I have a couple of questions for you. One is regarding the supplements you mentioned. Yes. Uh, for example, uh, vitamin C, not everyone can take it. For uh, People with uh, GRG cannot. This is one uh, thing. Another thing is, as far as I know, maybe I'm wrong, but 5,000 uh, units of vitamin D for some people can be an overdose. So this is one question. And another question, uh, you, may, you had a slide at the beginning of your uh, presentation uh, that showed B cells and T cells. How would vaccine work for patients that have damaged immune system, uh, damaged, I don't know, B cells or C, uh, T cells. Thank you. <laughs> Many questions. Uh, vitamin C, I'm not sure I understand the question. I think uh, 500 milligrams twice a day, uh, increased to 1000 milligrams twice a day was the dose that was uh, suggested. Uh, vitamin D, 5,000 units a day uh, is not an overdose. You would have to take uh, tens of thousands, uh, if not 100,000 uh, units a day to, uh, uh, to make it a toxicity. And there are published cases of toxicity. So uh, more is not always better. But the best uh, way to proceed is it's very simple blood test. You can go and ask your primary care physician, uh, GP, to get you tested and if your level is low he will he will point you to a right dose uh, to start with and after a couple of months you can recheck uh, but i would submit to you that 5000 uh, units a day is not uh, it, it basically cannot harm you it may not help you but it will not harm you and then uh, people with damaged um, uh, immune system just like with uh, with everything else uh, first of all, certain types of vaccines could not be used in those, in, those, in those populations. So vaccines that are using attenuated viruses could not be used uh, because of the danger of uh, eliciting uh, uh, a full-blown infection uh, for two reasons. Number one, because there's no, um, uh, well, because there's no normal way of fighting or, or diminished uh, possibility of fighting this and the virus then could multiply itself uh, incredibly and, and your lungs would look like the ones uh, posted by Nick um, uh, during the transplant. So basically no longer look like lungs, they look more like a liver, like a solid organ rather than something that contains lots of air. 
so and and then if you give a vaccine to someone who who does not have a good immune system the response also will not necessarily elicit it, it will not elicit response that will uh, protect you uh, from getting infected with the COVID. Вопрос, вопрос такой. Недавно появилась новая информация, кажется, от датских ученых о том, что постоянное ношение маски может помочь, потому что мы постоянно, те, кто носит маску, постоянно получают небольшое количество вируса, и таким образом иммунная система научается с ним бороться. Значит, если эта информация верна, то почему бы просто, извините за примитивный вопрос, не принимать вирус в крошечных количествах ежедневно в виде таблеток? И в связи с этим продолжение этого вопроса, а какое минимальное количество вируса приводит к заражению? Сколько единиц вируса, сколько, не знаю, сколько вирусов нужно, чтобы заразить человека? 100, 10 тысяч? I claim ignorance, so that's something that I would have to uh, check, and I don't know if anybody has answered, because I don't know if you can count. Nick, unless you have an answer, I have no better answer. I don't know if you can count, uh, if, if it would be even possible to see to which point, uh, you know, you, you don't have response, at which point you start having response, and at which point, depending on mass of the virus that is injected, inhaled, whatever challenge you're doing uh, would elicit a severe uh, action. And you have to remember that it's not only about the infecting factor, but also the host response to this factor. So if you fight it or not depends as much on how much of the virus entered your body as it depends on what kind of response you're able to elicit. Nick, do you have anything to add to this? Um. Yes, I want to add that, uh, you know, in the lab settings, we have, we do this, like when we infect mice with influenza A virus, we know how much virus provokes how much uh, damage and how much mortality. But this is uh, lab, lab settings, you know, everything is pretty measured and everything else except this is sterile and all the mice are genetically identical. So it, it's kind of possible to, to get some sort of uh, answer to your question, but it's very hard. And yeah, I don't know any answer right now. To add quickly to this mask, uh, you know, self inoculation with the mask, it's a very interesting concept. There's lots of concepts out there. Uh, please don't, um, don't go to someone who is known to have COVID and don't sniff his cough. I would suggest that you don't do that. Uh, <laughs> uh, the mask issue is also a, a confusion that was at the very beginning of the pandemic. Use the mask, don't, don't use the mask because only certain types of the mask are preventing you from inhaling the virus or protecting you from inhaling the virus. And these are very specific, specific masks, it's called N95. They have to be fitted and they have to fit very snugly. From experience, I can tell you that it's very unpleasant to wear for many hours in the OR and very difficult to breathe through them. Um, and only those masks are uh, protecting you from inhaling. The reason we are wearing masks is because not, none of us knows if we had contact with the virus and if we are carriers of the vi virus, even without expressing any, showing any signs of infection. So we are doing favor to everybody around us by thinking that we might have had a contact with the virus and maybe we have the virus. And if we talk without the mask, we will generate the droplets, they will get on the surface, someone else will touch the surface and will get infected. So this is a public health issue that we are wearing loosely fitted masks and they are protecting everybody from everybody in a sense that we are not leaving droplets everywhere. Um, and that's why at the beginning, I think it was confusion uh, that people were saying, well, why would I wear a mask that is not protecting me? Well, but it's protecting, if enough people are wearing the masks, it's protecting your population. That it's the whole, that's the whole issue. 
Петр, last question from me. Uh, as far as I understand, uh, melatonin is dispensed in five milligram pills. Should I take one every other day or should I just cut it's, it by... It can be one, two, three, four, five. I take ten. Really? So. I didn't see... Okay. Really, Fine. yeah. Yeah, it's 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 sold in different it's sold in different concentrations. Uh, I take it only if I uh, have a stretch of difficulty falling asleep, or if I make a mistake of taking a nap during the day, because I know that if I take a nap during the day, especially longer than half an hour, like Sonia could use one now, um, I will have difficulty falling asleep. So um, on those days, I, I take five milligrams, sometimes ten. Again, no harm, no harm in taking two versus five versus ten. Well, definitely. Uh, it sounds it helps. It helps only because you sleep longer. And don't oh, just to get no, the virus. No, no. no. Actually, it, the the effect of melatonin dissipates relatively quickly. Um, it, it is a it is a quote fall asleep quicker, rather than stay asleep medication. Mm -hmm. A uh, question in regards to pregnancy. Does it affect the susceptibility to the virus and does it affect the um, severity of the disease in any way, shape or form? I know nothing about it, so I can't help you. Uh, if the group is interested, I will research it for you and uh, I will answer. Nick, do you know anything? Uh, yes, I'm, I'm reading aloud, out loud. Pregnancy and childbirth have not been shown to substantially alter susceptibility to or the clinical course of infection with SARS-CoV-2. Three references. So. Женя, should we congratulate you? В Канаде сейчас новый тест для детей используют, называется Gargle тест. Вопрос, во-первых, почему только для детей, потому что он менее инвазив, и, ну, то есть, и насколько он эффективен, если есть такая статистика. Um, so that was the test that was developed, I think, in, uh, at Yale, uh, I don't know, one of the Ivy League universities for sportsmen, for the most part, uh, just to very quickly um, uh, and uh, have very quick responses and relatively non-invasive, because basically the idea was that a sports team would be tested on a daily basis. So it's basically you clear your throat, you generate some spit, you spit in a tube, and it's tested in the answer is, I think, I think within hours, a couple of hours. Uh, the main, main chokehold, I think, is basically that there is no enough of the technology and tests available at this point to, to have it on the mass, on, on the mass, uh, on the mass scale. But I think um, if we don't find vaccine quickly, quickly and the issue of, uh, of, again, public health and how, how frequently to test people and who should be tested, uh, then it will be much more uh, prevalent. Uh, I see it as a, as a test, uh, major test moving forward as a, one of the main tests. Yeah, because it's from yesterday in um, Canada, we use it for uh, kids four plus in grade 12. No, I, I, you know, if I had a choice, I'd rather have this than someone sticking Q-tip all the way back through my nose and, and no. <laughs> scratching the back of my nose and my throat, that's for sure. Uh, there's a great question in the chat. How has the treatment of infected and already sick patients in hospital has changed from February to September? Has mortality rate improved? Mortality rate for the most part have improved because of the mass testing that was introduced. You have to remember that the availability of the testing at the beginning was very limited. So only people who were sick uh, showing some signs of the disease were tested. And of course, if you test only sick, infected and sick people, you will have a much higher mortality rate than if you take test lots of people 
who may or may not be sick. So if you have done uh, lots of tests, um, now the majority of the people were tested at the beginning were elderly, elderly people because they were getting sick or severely sick. Now you have people who are COVID positive but are young and their chance of fighting the, uh, the virus is 80% as Nick showed you, uh, or even more for younger people, more than 80%. So you have very large population of tested people and uh, mortality is decreasing due to just statistical issue. Uh, and again, uh, even on for more severely sick people, I think that we have learned to be more wise in what methods we are choosing and how we care for the people uh, in the ICU uh, environment, hospital and ICU environment. But again, it's not it's not because we have very effective medications. It's still, in, in major ways, it's still just supportive treatment. Uh, to answer precisely, because I see what is dangerously low blood oxygen, um, in medicine, we, we do 90% as a cutoff. So if you have 90% saturation or been below 90% saturation, that, that, uh, that is a red flag. Somewhere between 90 and 95, it's very much accept acceptable and in fact, if you would put uh, oximeter on yourself um, uh, throughout the night, so you would have many periods of uh, oxygenation that would be probably below 90%, especially those of you who snore. Uh, question, uh, how is the um, antibody test is reliable and why is it we still don't have it approved here in BC? Nick, wanna, wanna talk about this? Um, anecdotally, I know that it's uh, IgM. So there. Ты можешь по-русски отвечать за другой. Я не могу потому что у меня плохий русский. Okay. Петр, поправьте меня, пожалуйста, если что. Um, значит, тест на антитела два, IgM и IgG, и это два немного разных uh, антитела. И знаете, как бы из, от мамы я знаю, что ее тестировали там несколько раз на IgM, и тест, результат постоянно менялся. Это как бы в целом, в целом IgM, uh, поскольку IgM ан uh, антитело вырабатывается в организме чисто случайно, и оно просто uh, либо подходит для коронавируса, либо не подходит, то там есть некоторый uh, зазор того, насколько оно специфично. И, и соответственно, тест дает больше ложноположительных отрицательных uh, результатов. Вот. Для IgG тест должен быть довольно надежным. Но цифр я не назову. I will just add that um, uh, there was initially idea of doing this test so that people could have uh, antibody passport, meaning that if they have antibodies, that means that they are immune, uh, they can go into a situation where the COVID uh, virus is prevalent and uh, they can travel and have no restrictions and moving around and so on and so forth. The problem is that we don't know what is the concentration of immunoglobulins that is necessary to fight the infection. Uh, stability of the test is not exactly, and specificity of the test is not, not, not exactly established. So testing antibodies is not really giving you much of the responses about how well you will fare uh, <coughs> if, you, if you encounter a, a virus. No, gentlemen, uh, I, I understand that we're going to live with it for another year or year and a half. So my, at, le at the very least, uh, my question is, if you can suggest rely any reliable sources that we should follow in terms of update, information, anything that we uh, that trustworthy to a degree that you can assess. 
Rimon. Okay. Um, if you want to go to really scientific sources, to the source, I suggest that you do your searches. You first Google Google Scholar. Well, yeah, but I, I might not be able to understand half of what's written there. I realize that. I understand. Uh, well, so okay. this is what I am asking is about source of sort of popular general population kind of information, but somewhat reliable source. Yes. So I would look for some popular medical pages. Okay. okay. So there's something called MedPage, for example. Okay. There's something called... Uh, let me look. Nick, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it to you for a second and I'll look for something here. And what we should look for? COVID-19. Just, just type COVID-19. No, 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 no. It's not what I'm asking. That I get. I mean, what kind of develop, what, what, what information would be, uh, you know, positive, what negative? How should we? There's lots of questions there, I know. No, COVID treatment. If, you, if you're looking for what's new in, in, in treatment of COVID, you just type in keywords and, COVID, yeah. COVID treatment or COVID vaccine, mm -hmm. and everything that was recently published uh, will, uh, uh, will okay. pop up. Okay. Thanks. Well, I would like to add как бы общую информационную гигиену просто если... вот 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 мой, мой вопрос относился к вот этому термину который я не, не, никогда не слышал но поняла что именно об этом я и спрашиваю ну, я, то есть как бы правило хорошее правило что если там э, приводятся какие-то данные должен быть ссылка на источник этих данных обычно э, okay. обычно стать как бы исследования про лекарства или про механизмы болезни, они должны ссылаться на научные публикации, которые выходят в... То есть это научные исследовательские уни... институ... институты, университеты и так далее всякие. И да? больницы, больницы тоже. Боль... То больницы. Есть, есть медицинские научные журналы, они больше покрывают э, клиническую часть и публикуются, то есть есть публикуются в журналах, туда присылают публикации авторы, которые врачи работают mm -hmm. в разных больницах. Есть рядом, рядом с ними живут какие-нибудь фундаментальные ученые, которые пытаются э, расковырять механизм, по которому работает та или иная болезнь, в том числе ковид. Вот. А, они публикуют немного в других журналах, иногда они пересекаются. Вот. Ребят, спасибо. Uh -huh. Может быть, это вопрос к Николаю. Я где-то читала, что не все, хотя большинство, но не все вырабатывают антитела. И у некоторых этот COVID, в общем-то, как это сказать, клиент с помощью этих T-cells. А так как у вас, вы, 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 вы с этим работаете, вы, вы, вы встречались с, с такими данными или... Это просто какие-то проблемы в том, как мерили антитела. Мне кажется, я читал несколько работ, да, где, где показано, что где есть некоторые свидетельства о том, что с, анти, с выработкой антител именно на SARS-CoV-2 не все так хорошо. То есть с одной стороны, из исследований на животных нам известно, что довольно быстро затухает, ну, уровень антител падает после инфекции, и, и его нужно, чтобы продлевать иммунитет у животных, например, от других коронавирусов, им нужно периодически там, раз в год давать новую вакцину. Вот. Это, пожалуй, все, что мне сейчас известно. Ну и что это значит, что можно им болеть как бы много раз? Потому что теряешь, в конечном итоге теряешь иммунитет. Мне кажется, Петр про это говорил, что это превратится в... В herd immunity, в herd immunity, в конечном итоге. Грипп. 
В Сезон, сезонное заболевание. Ослабнет, ну да, понятно. Петр, пожалуйста. Да-да-да, угу. я помню, он говорил. Проблема с ковидом, что никто его с людей не видел. Да? This is why it is so much more infectious and this is why it's so much more dangerous as far as health and, and life or death than a flu virus. Because no one in humanity has seen it. This is the virus that jumped probably from bats uh, to humans. Um, and there is many more out there that are looking and just waiting. Um, as, oh, yeah. As, 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 the as, thing that happened to us. As, yeah. as the number of humans is growing, as, as we will live closer and closer to wildlife and squeeze their living space, Um, as Chinese are getting richer and richer in other nations and everybody wants to eat meat and uh, then, you know, everybody wants to eat their pangelion uh, for some reason. I don't know why, but uh, they do. Um, these things will happen. Uh, and the problem with those viruses is they are novel, right? They, at the beginning, everybody was talking novel coronavirus, which means there is absolutely no immunity in, in the human race. There is no immunity to this thing. Uh, and that's why that's why mortality of the flu is so much lower than mortality of the COVID because there's no herd immunity. Я хочу добавить, что было несколько исследований, в которых зафиксирована кросс-реактивность клеток. То есть есть люди, которые не болели ковидом, они болели просто коронавирусами, которые простудные, и их Т-клетки реагируют на SARS-CoV-2. Это не дает... Непонятно, какой эффект это дает. Это, возможно, ухудшает вообще проблему и течение болезни для этих людей. Не факт, что это помогает, но там есть некоторые вот эти вот коронавирусы не страшные, с которыми есть некоторые пересечения по э, иммунитету, но, но не такое, которое дает э, herd immunity. Вряд ли. Еще может, по, по, извините, еще один вопрос. А, вот э, 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 как, э, как в общем-то э, где-то вот тоже я где читала, что можно рекомбинант ACE2 использовать как treatment, то есть как ловушка, фейк, что вирус набросится на вот этот протеин вместо того, чтобы атаковать клетки, если его достаточно большая концентрация. И, и это было в каких-то там начальных клинических испытаний? Это куда-нибудь двинулось вперед и, и, или в общем-то, заглох. I can't say anything about this, but I will, uh, I'll check it and I'll post it on, uh, on Facebook webpage. Thank you. А что известно про то, как этот вирус играет с курением? Писали, что курички болеют тяжелее, но писали, что курички не заражаются. Что на самом деле известно? Ничего про это не знаю, честно говоря. Но если курите, перестаньте, пожалуйста. Специальный совет вообще-то. Я предлагаю последние два вопроса, ладно, потому что мы уже действительно давно, давно мучим наших лекторов. И это безумно интересно. Я, честно говоря, я бы еще повторила. Потому что, ну вот, я думаю, что все согласны, что... Мы сегодня получили такую порцию информации, с которой нам еще предстоит довольно долго жить и довольно долго ее переваривать. Так что я предполагаю, что э, вопросы еще будут продолжать поступать. Давайте заведем отдельный пост в группе, хорошо? Чтобы мы могли э, и Петра, и Николая еще спросить. Э, ну, то есть я, я понимаю, что я буду задавать вопросы еще неделю вперед. Э, давайте последние два вопроса, ладно? Да, я как спрашивающий, а может Николай ответит? что у него есть ответить на мой вопрос. А потом еще два вопроса. Кратко хочу ответить про курение, что мне кажется, что 
конкретно у нас в реанимации, по-русски ICU — это реанимация, да? У нас нету никакой связи, но довольно много людей просто не ответили на вопрос. Мы не знаем про именно людей с ковидом вообще, какой у них статус. С обычной пневмонией другой, кажется, есть положительный... Есть корреляция между курением и худшим прогнозом. Вот. Мне кажется, что из других реанимаций было несколько репортов, которые тоже проводили положительную корреляцию между тяжестью заболевания и статусом курения. Спасибо. А еще, наверное, предпоследний вопрос, да, или последний, не знаю. Утверждается, что у детей еще не, не полностью развит вот этот рецептор ACE2, и поэтому они меньше болеют, и, возможно, меньше являются переносчиками, потому что некуда вирусу прицепиться, и, соответственно, от них уже не может попасть. Это правда или нет, и насколько это достоверно? И в таком случае, если это так, то, значит, можно спокойно детей выпустить в школу, видимо, в этом случае? Или это все домыслы? И кого считать детьми в этом случае? Ну, я не знаю, до какого возраста развивается этот рецептор, в каком он становится в полном объеме у детей. I don't have a good, uh, good answer. Uh, only what I have uh, seen a couple of weeks ago uh, published, which means that the, the density and the number of the virus particles that uh, children uh, can transfer is actually oftentimes higher than in the adults, or at least the same. How does it translate into um, the fact that they are severely sick much less often than the adults and the development of ACE2, uh, ACE2 receptor? I don't know. And I think only very small children uh, probably have still uh, uh, non-developed uh, receptor system, I would imagine that around one, two years of age, uh, these systems are pretty well developed. Nick? Uh, точного ответа нет пока. Uh, то есть, есть несколько гипотез, почему uh, дети болеют меньше, но, но четко непонятно почему. Uh, я хочу сказать, что как бы есть статистика, да, по которой да, дети там, у них маленькая доля, но есть конкретные дети, которые заболевают, и потом им все равно нужен, все равно они оказываются в реанимации, и все такое. И, и, и как у них там дела потом идут, у тех, у, у той небольшой доли, которая все-таки заболела, довольно плохо. Поэтому э, мне, ну, то есть там про... Я, я бы точно не сказал, что там вот дети, это просто не глядя э, защищенные группы везде, и мы, мы с ними так и... Ну, то есть мы их перестаем защищать. Нет, мне кажется, не так. Последний вопрос. Два, один. Нет вопросов? Все, спасибо огромное. Петр Николай, вы замечательные. Мы страшно вам благодарны. Давайте мы делаем. Это было реально классно. Спасибо. Большое спасибо. А, до, до встречи. Мы продолжим задавать вам вопросы, потому что это, это правда надо осмыслить. Фактов столько и данных столько. Спасибо и до встречи. Спасибо. Пока.